Hello, and welcome to Nosotros, the podcast that explores the political and the cultural with San Antonio in mind. I'm your host, Elaine Ayala, a Metro columnist for the San Antonio Express News. My guest today is Eduardo Diaz. Some of you who have been in, who've been in San Antonio a long time will remember him, though he hasn't lived here full time for a while. He's a former San Antonian who stays connected here, but has lived and worked in Washington, D.C. since 2008, correct? Correct. He joined the Smithsonian Institution as director of its Latino Seno Center, but is currently acting deputy director of the National Museum of the American Latino. Congratulations. Thank you very That's much. so Elaine. fabulous. It's the place that's yet to have a home. Uh, and is at least a decade away from real infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Diaz was executive director of the National Hispanic Cultural Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico, before heading to the nation's capital. Before that, he was he co-funded the International Accordion Festival in San Antonio. And before that, from 1981 to 1999, he was Director of Cultural Affairs for the City of San Antonio. He holds a law degree from the University of California at Davis and a bachelor's degree from San Diego State University. Welcome, Eduardo. It's a pleasure to be here, Elaine. Thank you so much for the invite. Before we talk about the progress of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Latino, I'd love to hear your thoughts on San Antonio. You left in 99, correct? That sounds about right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you probably <clears throat> visit from time to time. You yeah. have a house here. Yep. It's changed a lot, or maybe it's not changed very much since then. And um, tell us how it looks to you, especially uh, with regard to the arts, culture, and its institutions. Well, you know, I think San Antonio has always been sort of a cradle of Chicano art, Latino art, it, you know, artistic expression. Not only artistic expression, but just general cultural expressions for a long, long time. And it hasn't stopped being that cradle, right? Um, the city's modernized, I think, tremendously in terms of, uh, you know, just welcoming other cultural influences, uh, new people to the community. Um, I mean, the renovation that's happening around town. I mean, more skyscrapers, you know, it's just extraordinary what's happening. Just a little tidbit, you know, um, I become a fan of Cortado, right? There's a thought of the Cuban mm -hmm. coffee, kind of like a, uh, like a wet macchiato in between right. that and a mm -hmm. latte. Well, a Cortado, you couldn't even, I mean, the people look you at you. You couldn't order like, it. You know, like, uh, where were you? Are you from Miami or something? <laughs> but, uh, you know, now it's like, hey, yeah. no problem. Cortados are everywhere. I mean, that's just. <laughs> I just said a, a silly little, example, yeah, right? Yes. But um, and now you know, I live you know I live in Dignity Hill. My home is in Dignity Hill on the east side, and beforehand, you know, the east side didn't enjoy a particularly savory, uh, you know, reputation. Reputation, and now that has changed dramatically. So I just you know, there are just things that have changed here, right, um, um, in San Antonio that I think make it have more of a big city feel, do you know what I mean? Without losing its, small its character, That's you know? Right. So I, I think uh, in some ways it's developed quite nicely, right? Not to just have gone hog wild on... Yeah, on, it's not Houston. No, it's definitely not Houston. <laughs> and definitely not Austin either. No, Thank where God. it's r rampant and yeah, no. lost, totally has lost yeah. their origins and character. No, um, San Antonio still has a big soul. Well, San, Ad San Antonio <clears throat> still has a big soul. And as I said in, an, in several other podcasts and columns, is that San Antonio remains the Mexican-American cultural capital of the United States. And people outside San Antonio and Los Angeles have said that no. because of um, our history. Right. Right. Okay. So these, uh, oh, you didn't really address arts and cultural institutions. Are you purposely not no, talking no, no, about no, them? No, 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 no. I mean, I think, I want you, you know, I worked at the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center, right? So, and then of course, as I was the head of arts and cultural affairs for the, for the city of San Antonio for 11 years. So, you know, I saw the growth of say, see, I can remember when we gave a $25,000 grant to say, see, 
through the King William Neighborhood Association because they didn't even have a 501c3. <laughs> That's incredible. So and they, now were, um, they were umbrelling. I mean, and look where Stacey is now. Yes. I mean, so, yeah, Centro Cultural Aslan, San Anto Cultural Arts, uh, the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, you know, which ended up actually suing the city for over a grants decision. That and they won. They won. You know, I, I, that's the first time I had to testify in federal court. It was very interesting. Got to do a little bit of my law stuff. But uh, uh, practice a little law. But um, no, um, yeah, no, I'm very familiar. I remember the trials and tribulations of the San Antonio Symphony, right? SAMA, the witty. And, you know, so I know these institutions uh, at that time, I had to deal with them, you know, on a daily basis and through our grants program and, and also trying to support them in other ways. Yeah. When you landed in Washington, it was to direct the Smithsonian's Latino Center. Correct. Tell <clears> us <throat> how that institution has evolved in the 15 years or so. Well, it's 25 now. It's well, 25. No, 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 no. Your, your my, 15 years. Yes, uh -huh. my 15 years. Um, well, and, I, and, and mention some of your proudest moments and, yeah. and how, um, you know, and the Molina Center as it is now. So yeah. Take us through that. Well, you know, the, the Latino Center emerges after a 1994 report called Willful Neglect. I, I think the title of the report says it all. It was a commissioned report that really took uh, the Smithsonian to task on its neglect of the contributions that the Latino community has made in building this country and shaping this national culture, right? I mean, it really just, it really took a real whack at the Smithsonian, if you will. And I think that spurred uh, the institution to say, you know, this is not right. We have to do something um, about it and address this, this vacuum, this, this neglect. And so, um, a couple of years later, there was a report called Towards the Shared Vision, which more was more of a planning document, right? So like, you're not doing enough. Okay, well, what are you going to do to address that? And part of that led to the creation of what is what was the Smithsonian Latino Center, um, which operated for 20, 25 years before it is now merged with the new National Museum of the American Latino, and rightly so. You know, uh, if somebody, people, people ask me what my job is, and my job is to help transform the Smithsonian into a Latino serving institution. That's, that's my into main. A Latino serving institution. Right. So that Perfect. Latino presence is there. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy because the Smithsonian is 19 museums, nine research centers, a zoo, a recording. I mean, we have our own recording label, Smithsonian Folkways. So it's, it's a, it's a gargantuan institution. And so, you know, you take your victories here and you, you know, you place curators there. They build collections. They organize exhibits. They organize public and educational programs. They publish and so forth. There's a lot of content on the web now that has to do with the Latino experience around the country. So I'm very proud of what we've been able to do. We've been able to hire or provide in the support for Smithsonian units, right? Museums and research centers to bring on Latina and Latino curators and curatorial assistants and archivists. And the impact has been extraordinary because they're embedded expertise within the units of the Smithsonian. In fact, this Thursday, uh, this Friday, actually, a major exhibit opens at the National Portrait Gallery on the War of 1898, the Spanish-American War. And that is co-curated by Taina Caragol, who is the cur Latina curator of the National Portrait Gallery. Without w without her presence there, that show doesn't happen. Do you know what right. I mean? Yes. I mean, she, when she got there, when Taina got there uh, to the Portrait Gallery, she's, she's originally from Puerto Rico, um, less than 1% of the holdings of the National Portrait Gallery were portraits of our people, from members of our community. You know, and since then, I, I've lost track of how many portraits she's accessioned into the collection, but the needle's moved. Yeah. And then you say, well, you mean you really didn't know who Gloria Stefan was or like Sonia Sotomayor or mm -hmm. Flaco Jimenez or mm -hmm. Sandra Cisneros, to name a few San Antonio people. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't know who Selena was, you know. So uh, They didn't. <laughs> well, so now you go there and, you know, you have, you know, Rodolfo Anaya, you have Ruben Blades, you have Rita Moreno. You know, now you're starting to see people from our community who have made a difference in our culture and and. and and in the United States generally. And so now you see that. But if she's not there, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. The Smithsonian American Art Museum now has the largest collection by far 
uh, of Latina Latino art of any major art museum in the country. And that's because Carmen Ramos was there for several years. She's now moved on to be the chief curator and, um, at the National Gallery, right? Which is not a Smithsonian institution, but a very important mm -hmm. museum in this country. And of course, it, it located in Washington, DC. So that's the kind of impact that I feel really good about. Today, um, the 25th of April, the National Museum of the American Latino will receive the best exhibition award for 22 for the current exhibit at the Molina Family Latino Gallery, which we're extremely proud of. So there's a lot of things I can be proud of. We have a Latino Museum Studies program, which has, I don't know how many alums we have. It's in the maybe 300 range. These are young scholars and museum professionals that come to the Smithsonian that we help train uh, to become the future workforce, uh, not only at the Smithsonian, but around the country as well. You know, we're a national museum, so I think there's a responsibility for us not only to create opportunities for people to come and work at the Smithsonian, but to to work at other institutions around around the United States, and not just in the arts and the history museums and the children's museums, at the natural history museums and so forth, places like the Witty and so forth. And so, in fact, a former Witty employee is now working with us. We stole him from <laughs> San Antonio, uh, Josh Segovia. So, no, I I feel proud of a lot of things, you know, but I think really. It, coming to the point where the Smithsonian really is a Latino serving institution, once you move that needle, I think on, on many fronts, um, you know, I feel like, you know, we've accomplished a lot under my leadership. And so I, I could point to one thing or another, but I think it's just generally establishing Latino presence at the Smithsonian for me has been the most rewarding accomplishment. Absolutely. And, um, your colleagues um, are doing a fabulous job. The last time I was in Washington, <coughs> by the way, the Portrait Gallery is one of my favorites. It's a Washington. great museum. It's a and, great museum. Um, and I walked in there, and I was there to see, I think, Vincent Valdez's um, portrait the, of his grandparents. Mm -hmm, yeah. yeah, and uh, <clears throat> and then I was thrilled not only to see the Latino portraits, but the African American ones that were some of them were great surprises of people who had the had the wherewithal to get a portrait made in in the eighteen hundreds or in the late seventeen hundreds right. and and then be collected. It's right. it's marvelous. Well, you mentioned Vincent Valdez. I mean, that's this is the outwind portraiture competition. It is the most prestigious portraiture competition in the country, and it is incredibly ridiculously competitive so vincent's in there and so is maria hernandez who's from here as well she works at um the national association for latino art and culture she's in the exhibit wow. right and so we've That's had just more great. latinas and latinas there's a guy from the valley um rigoberto gonzalez who's also in in the competition as well gaspar Enriquez from el paso uh, Mar uh, mariana olague from also from el paso so What's the name of the competition again? It's called the, the Outwind Boochievers, what it's called, Outwind. Uh, comp we just call it short for Outwind. So that's every, I think, two or three years. And then, so it's a very hard co uh, competition. But to have Vincent in there and Maria Hernandez and the, the other artists from, from Texas is really quite something, frankly. And you can see that, you know, the curators and the judges, you know, that are, you know, the panelists judging the, the competition recognize the the level the quality of the craftsmanship of the of the work and so you know that portends well for the future how a smithsonian gets built uh, and all the entities that have to be involved can be a <coughs> mystery to americans who yeah. saw the national museum of the african american of african american history and culture right. debuted to just enormous popularity right. tell us a little bit about what <clears throat> how that all happens and what's ahead for the latino primo cousin <laughs> yeah um which may be or may not be on the National Mall. You can touch on that as well. Sure. Uh, building a museum at the Smithsonian is, is, a, is an ordeal, and it's multi-year. Uh, you mentioned the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, that bill gets signed, and the, the bill to establish, I mean, every national museum has to be authorized by Congress, right? Mm -hmm. So that particular museum was authorized by Congress in 2003, 
It was signed off on by um, the late the, the the later President Bush. Um, the director of the museum, Lonnie Bunch, who is now the secretary of the Smithsonian, gets there in 2005. They establish a gallery similar to what we just did at the National Museum of American History in 2009. And then they cut the ribbon on their new beautiful museum in September of 2016. So that's 13 years between the time that the bill is signed until they actually cut the ribbon. And before that, there's there's years of negotiating. Oh. And, you know, calling for the museum. Mm -hmm. And so the same way with us. If you read the if you read the Willful Neglect Report of 1994, which I referenced earlier, there is a recommendation in there to a stat to to call for. There is a recommendation in there for a National Museum of the American Latino. So that's 1994, right? The legislation to establish the National Museum of the American Latino doesn't happen until December of 2020, right? That was a long lapse. That was a long time. Yes, and th I remember that that there was a commission established in 2000, I want to say 2009, if I'm correct, to, to look into the National Museum of the American Latino or establishing the National Museum of the American Latino. Well, that there was a report that was submitted symbolically on Cinco de Mayo, of 2011. Oh my God, that's ridiculous. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> okay. for some whatever, yeah, you know, symbolic, I guess, reasons. Uh, so that was submitted to President Obama at the time and members of Congress in May of 2011. <clears throat> Later that fall began the process of, a, you know, submitting legislation uh, to to actually establish the the museum. But it, not, it, the bill never went anywhere, and so we at the Smithsonian Latino Center. <clears throat> we're waiting around and we said, you know what? And we don't see any action happening in Congress. So what if we build a gallery? Inside another institution. Exactly. Another, another Smithsonian institution. And, you know, we said to ourselves, listen, if they pass the bill sometime, then we switch gears and we go into museum building mode. If they don't pass the bill, well, we'll have a gallery, a physical presence on the mall. Mm -hmm. Well, that was all well and good, but we didn't, <laughs> we didn't have a plan. Uh, we didn't have any space locked up and we didn't have any money. Yeah. So that was like the gallery. <laughs> yeah. Minor details, right? But, so that but was like. So that people understand the Latino Center what, was not an actual exhibition area right no it was we, just an office it, it was, was an where office. you were we were we were the ones behind the scenes so you would curate things and create right. them for some and, other place or, or provide resources for other smithsonian units to do latino programming as i mentioned before that's right hire curators support their collecting initiatives that's right support their exhibitions their publications their public and educational programs so we were behind the scenes but this really meant for us going forward with a gallery project, really becoming front facing, right? Really become public facing as a, as a unit of the Smithsonian. So it took us seven years, <clears throat> you know, to raise the money, to find the space, to do the planning, to hire a project manager, to curate an exhibition and so forth. And, and we were very proud to open the Molina Family Latino Gallery in June of Last year, 2022. The Molina fun family, family Latino funded family. this or part no, of this? The Molina family, just so folks know, these are the sons and daughters of Dr. C. David Molina and his wife, Mary. C. David Molina was born in Yuma, Arizona to Mexican parents and was a teacher, really, but then decided, and so was his wife, Mary. They just, he decided to go to medical school which, at what is now UC Irvine, University of California, Irvine and became a general practitioner working in emergency medicine and noticed that there were a lot of poor people, mostly black and brown folks coming into the emergency room who really didn't have emergencies, but didn't have anywhere else to go to get basic medical care. So he said, well, wow, what if I build a clinic to serve this population? Um, you know, he had trouble getting bank financing because while he was a doctor, he was also a Mexican and had trouble getting bank financing. That's another issue. Mm -hmm. But he got financing for a, for a clinic. Well, that led to six clinics, led to 12 clinics, led to 24 clinics, and led to uh, Molina Healthcare, which became a Fortune 500 company trading on the stock exchange and a major HMO operating multi-state. Mm -hmm. They had five children, two doctors, a lawyer, an architect, and an arts educator. We became close to the family through one of our board members, our board chair, actually, who's from, from the Valley, actually, um, 
Roel Campos. Anyway, we got close to the family and convinced them that a gallery on the National Mall was a fitting way to honor the legacy of their parents, who were these social entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and really very vibrant community members. So they each, um, five children, they each gave us $2 million. So five times two is 10, right? And that really what launched. And after that, then Target and Walmart mm -hmm. and the banks and Microsoft and Disney and Coca-Cola and you name it. and They all lined up. That's wonderful. Lined up. And we've raised $28 million for that gallery, which needs, we raised that kind of money because that's how long, that's the kind of money I think we're going to need to sustain its operation for 10 or 12 years while the museum project per se gets going, right? It gets planned, gets designed by architects and actually gets constructed. So take <clears throat> us through what needs to happen to uh, now. You told me earlier that the National Museum of the American Latino may be a decade away, 12 yeah. years away. What? 10 to 12. Uh -huh, I would 10 say. to 12. Okay. And so how much money needs to be raised? <laughs> um, how do you find uh, a site? Yeah. I know it's sure. under a lot of discussion. It is under discussion. What the other, the other thing I should mention um, is that the Smithsonian is raising twins, <clears throat> right? Because Oh, the uh, Women's Museum. Yes, the American right. Women's History Museum was also authorized with the same stroke of the pen um, as the National Museum of the American Latino. So, I mean, it's 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 hard enough building one That's museum right. on the mall, but to build two, wow. You know, so, you know, it really depends on where the where the museum is sited. I mean, I'm trying to get to your, your question of... of um, the funds, right, or what's the budget looks like. I mean, but, you know, by way of example, I mean, about, by the way, I should back up and say that the legislation as written and as authorized, as passed and as signed uh, as law says that the calls for the Congress to be in for 50 percent of the expenses or the costs to plan, design and construct the new museum. Okay. So that's if, good. If you estimate between eight hundred million and a billion dollars for the total project, don't say a billion. That's ridiculous. No, it it could climb into that oh my into that God. area. I'm not saying it will. It could go into that area. So, so it's gonna five hundred million dollars. Well, has to be raised. I, I should have mentioned that. I, I always <laughs> I always I always hesitate because again we don't know where the site's going to be. It could make it could be considerably less. But we're planning for just in case. Do you know what I mean? Uh, just so, in case. This um, but I mean, uh, it's expensive now. The, yes, yeah. I mean, everything. you have no idea. I mean, in the museum world, what's happening just for shipping and just for and COVID, of course, had a lot to do with this. You know, in terms of supply chain issues mm -hmm. or work stoppages or shipping delays. I mean, it's a miracle that we got the Molina Family Latino Gallery up in time because we were doing this in, in the era of COVID when it was really, really. Where things were shut down, right, and and the supply chain issues and the shipping delays were real, and some, you know, and there's still kind of a hangover from all that because we're still experiencing that. I mean, the prices of things has just skyrocketed, and so, you know, we're planning on on having to raise that kind of money. We've raised we're we're about fifty million already in, in terms of for the museum fifty. Fifty million yeah, already. We're already in that. We've raised that amount of money for the the galleries paid for. Mm -hmm. Now we're raising money for the museum, and so we've rent, we're almost at fifty. Now to the question of location, which was the other part of your question, the, the there there has been plan there has been consulting work done already to find and decide on locations, possible locations for both museums, right? For the Women's History Museum and the and Army and the National Museum of the American Latino. So. Everybody, of course, wants it to be on the mall, and that's understandable. Um, there are sites on the mall. Here's where the rub is. There is currently in place a prohibition for f that that prohibits the building of new museums on the mall. This is a uh, a regulation that's in place in place, excuse me, by the National Park Service, which is the Department Department of the Interior, right? <clears throat> and they're the ones that manage the mall. National Park Service. Is there space if they were to reverse? There is. Here's the here's the rub. To only con Congress has ha, has to remove the prohibition on future building. It's called the reserve of the mall. The two sites that have been uh, identified for both the Women's Museum and the National Museum of the American Latino 
are fall within what is called the reserve of the National Mall. And there's right now, presently, no more construction is permitted on the reserve. Mm -hmm. So Congress has to go back in and basically tell the Department of Interior, remove the prohibition on mm -hmm. the building of new museums. They haven't done that. So we're kind of stuck in neutral right now in terms of the site selection, but that isn't stopping us. We're out collecting. In fact, I'm in San Antonio. I was in Corpus earlier, Corpus Christi. You know, we're meeting with photographers. I, I met with Ramon Hernandez. I met with Al Rendon, everybody knows, mm -hmm. looking at their phot photographic archives because oh, they're am we're looking, both of them am are amazing. We're looking for images that will support, for example, the next exhibition that goes into the Molina Gallery. We were in Corpus to visit the Selena Museum because there are, the National Museum of American History has a couple of items from Selena's collection, but we met with Suzette, who is um, Selena's sister and the mm -hmm. drummer of the band, you know, just to kind of let her know, you know, we're here and we just wanted to check it out. We didn't, we weren't there to like, say, I want that. No, it wasn't <laughs> like that at all. We mm -hmm. were just saying here, we're the National Museum of the American Latino. We're interested in, in, in Selena's legacy. Um, we didn't ask for anything and we won't ask for anything right now. It's, but we think Selena, because of who she was and her incredibly powerful legacy, you know, should be represented in the National Museum of the American Latino for reasons obvious. In the same way Celia Cruz, for example, should That's also right. be should also be in, uh, represented in the new museum. We went to visit the Galvan Ballroom, which was one of the legendary ballrooms in Corpus Christi on the west side of Corpus, where big acts, jazz, Tejano, Conjunto, I mean, Duke Ellington played there. There was Latin jazz that went on. We were interested in Latin jazz. So mm -hmm. uh, Bobby Galvan, who's actually a Nueces County judge and a descendant of his, his grandfather, was one that built the, the Galvan Ballroom, took us there. And it was like, I mean, you felt like you were back in the 50s or 60s. Yeah, it was remarkable. Fabulous. So anyway, you know, the places where our community gathered for music and for quinceañeras and for bodas and all of that is important to us. I mean, it's important for us to tell those kinds of stories that they're, that are the everyday stories. I mean, forget a little bit about the celebrity, you know, of Selena or Celia Cruz or Eva Longoria or whoever. You know, we're interested in just how our community celebrated and how they lived and how they were with each other and, uh, you know, those, I think, are the things that really enrich uh, a museum experience, in my view. So we're busy. You know, we're collecting. I want to go back to yeah. one thing, though. Sure. Is it, um, <clears throat> is it easier or uh, less expensive to build from scratch or to take that last building on the mall yeah, that the is not industries, yeah. that is the first Smithsonian. You know, I wish if I was in, you know, my, my daughter who lives who lives here in San Antonio, Sibone, is an architect. Uh, and so I want, I don't want to say I, it would be, she would kill me because I was like, well, how do you know? You haven't even done an engineering study <laughs> on, on the, the status of the building. Or, you know, one of the things we deal with at the mall is it's water. You know, the mall is built over a swamp. Yes. Right. That's like and so, Washington. so, so the issue <laughs> is, on a swamp. so the issue That's is, do we, how far down can we go mm -hmm. to excavate before we hit water? Because mm -hmm. the water table is not that far down okay and so i wish i could give you an answer but i really can't because i'm not an engineer i don't know what the substrata mm -hmm. condition is or on the buildings or on the sites that have been selected so I, I i think i can fairly say that there are going to be some issues right and that need be to be expensive. explored uh -huh. and it's going to be expensive to build yes. or it's going to be expensive to restore the arts and industry building is probably not large enough for what we need and so that means you would have to excavate at least go one floor down mm -hmm. now the good news there is that it may or may not be a water table issue because you're only going down one floor anything more than that i don't know mm -hmm. but i'm not an engineer i'm not a, yeah i wouldn't know but um, either way it's going to be expensive um, so you're likely to be not in Washington anymore when this thing gets built. I will not be in Washington when this gets built. Just because I know how old you are. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You'll probably be here on the on the east side. Yes. Um, and visiting Washington when you drinking get. cortados. That's right. That's right. Um, tell us what your hopes are for the museum, for yourself as you sort of wind down this legendary career <clears throat> yeah. um, and come back to San Antonio. Well, first on the museum side, you know, 
well, the first exhibit is called Presente, Latino History of the United States. And I think what people need to, to understand and appreciate is how diverse our community is, right? Uh, there's a video in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Presente exhibit called Somos, and it really does capture the essence of who we are, both racially, both ethni eth ethnically, both country of origin wise, you know, LGBTQ. I mean, you know, so we are black, we are, we are indigenous, we are European, uh, we are, um, we are Asian, we are Asian, we're, we're queer, we're cis, we're straight, we're, we're all those things. We come from multiple experiences. <clears throat> some, you know, some in some cases because of Texas, we didn't cross the border. The border crossed us after the U.S.-Mexico War of 1848. There are other members of the community that just got here two weeks ago, That's right? right? And so all of that, to try to, to try to reflect all of that and to represent all of that experience is really hard. And, and, but it's the challenge that we um, willfully accept and with pride and with, and with um, earnest intent. And I think the Latino Museum is going to have to continue in that vein of representing the, the full measure and the broad diversity that our community really is. And I'll say one other thing, that it has to be accessible. We were very, very intent on ensuring that the Molina Gallery was accessible to visitors who have um, who are blind or have low vision or who are deaf or have a hearing impairment and in some cases who have a brain-based or cognitive uh, challenge for me ada was well it has to be well of course it has to be ada meet ada standards but that's not going to get you the kind of experience that we really want to have people with those conditions to have in the gallery mm -hmm. and i would like to think that the museum is going to be committed to that i so will always kind of leading the way in yeah, that in that way. i mean i'm already i am and you asked me what i'm gonna do i'm already a contributor to the molina, molina gallery on my name and the honor in honor of my parents is there in a plaque so i will always be supportive financially of the museum and if when i retire and come back to san antonio you know i'll be available to them as on a consulting basis you know if they need for me to go check out a collection or you know go to corpus or go to el paso or go to houston or dallas or whatever to you know to talk with people or to a look at collections, like a scout mm -hmm. for them. I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, but I, you know, but I, I do need to, I do need to pack things up, if you will. I mean, I love <laughs> and, DC. And, DC and your is so daughter, wonderful. your daughters are here or? My daughter, what? one of my, the C1A, Diaz Sanchez is an architect, as I said, works for the city and is really into affordable housing, um, works for the housing office. She's doing tremendous work and she's real committed to, to improving um, housing opportunities for those who really need it here in San Antonio. My other daughter is a professor of Chicana Chicano Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And of course, I'm proud of her and her work that she does. Of course, she's a you know a scholar and and a real committed to her students, obviously, and a and a rabble rouser in some ways, and 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 for the right absolutely the right reason. So I'm very proud of both of them so why and they're from here they both went to Brackenridge High School yeah that's right there you go. where their mom worked um, yeah. thank you so much for being no, with it's my like pleasure. old times you yeah. know back when there was a cultural affairs office at the at oh the, my gosh I was I the first director of cultural affairs because remember it was in the, it was buried in the parks department that's right that's right and it was wasn't even director. a real department yeah yeah and to think that that's how I'm sorry but how the city viewed its arts community when it was so incredibly right. vibrant long before. Right. Well, look at before. it now. Look at it's it It's got now. a public art program. It has a museum. Yeah, I met with uh, Crystal, uh, who's now Jones, right? Crystal Jones, Crystal. Yeah. yes. Um, we some, went to the Center of the Artists and saw that terrific exhibit now, uh, Soy de Texas, right? Yes. A tremendous show. I mean, it's the, the department that I start, that I headed at the very beginning has blossomed into a yes. full board, you know, go ahead, straight ahead uh, department that's doing a lot of great things. And so hats off to them. Uh, thanks for joining my us. Pleasure. And thanks to everybody out in podcast land. Thank you very joining. much, Elaine. My pleasure to be here. <laughs>